Hello, thank you for joining us. We'll begin our session in just a few seconds after everyone has joined the room. So please pardon this awkward silence for just a few seconds. Our room is quickly filling up, Nathan. All right, that's what we like. Yes. We hope it doesn't <laughs> clear <laughs> okay. out once I start talking. <laughs> Great, it looks like the numbers are slowing down. People are still trickling in just a little bit, but let's, let's begin here. So hello again, my name is Phil Russo. I am the executive director of NAFTA. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to NAFTA's 2022 Leadership Summit. For those who attended our first session earlier this morning, welcome back. NAFTA's Leadership Summit has been created solely to provide help, information, guidance, and tools to veterinary technicians who are volunteer leaders of vet tech associations and specialty academies. As such, today we won't be talking about anything clinical. Instead, we'll be focusing on critical areas of association management, such as government relations, governance, member engagement, and generating non-dues revenue. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over. First, please know that this session is scheduled for one hour and is being recorded for later access on NAFTA's YouTube channel. If at any point during the session you need technical assistance, please send me a private message through the chat box. Just click on chat and find my name, Phil Russo, and just send me a private message and I'll help you out. Also, please feel free to use the chat box to add any comments, to talk to each other, or to send the virtual send the speaker some virtual applause. Please don't use the chat box for questions as they may get lost in the long string of conversation. For questions, please use the Q&A option on your screen. Just click on the Q&A icon and type your question, and we'll stop occasionally during the session uh, to answer your questions. We want this to be a really interactive session. And now on to the session. This session focuses on the critical topic of best practice policies and governance documents for associations. Our expert speaker is NAFTA's legal counsel, Nathan Breen. Mr. Breen is a partner with the firm Howe and Hutton, which specializes in legal services to associations. Nathan serves as counsel to national and international trade associations across a variety of industries. He provides guidance in the areas of association governance, antitrust, intellectual property, certification and accredi accreditation, ANSI standards, information technology, hospitality, employment law, and risk management. If it has something to do with managing an association, Nathan helps you out. Nathan earned his undergraduate degree from DePaul University and his JD degree from the John Marshall Law School. He is a member of the Chicago Bar Association and is admitted to practice law in Illinois and the U.S. District Court for Northern for the Northern District of Illinois. Nathan is basically the guy who helps keep NAFTA's board and me out of legal trouble. So I know you'll learn a lot from him. So without further delay, here is Nathan Breen. All right, thanks, Phil. Quite the yep. introduction there. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about um, best practices and governing documents. Um, this is going to be directed at, I think, a variety of levels. Some of this is going to be more relevant to leadership than kind of the rank and file membership. Um, but at the same time, if you've got engagement with the nonprofit association, it's good to know all of these things. Um, and it's, it's going to be a bit much. We're going to be hitting a lot of topics in, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so with that in mind, you know, you're not expected necessarily to walk away from this uh, you know, with full knowledge of the details of the, the subjects we're going to go over. But uh, the goal here is, though, that you can spot general issues that may be a problem from a legal perspective and know how to kind of govern your approach accordingly so that you stay out of trouble uh, and you, the organization stays out of trouble. We, we say around the firm, um, it, it's always cheaper and easier to keep you out of trouble than to get you out of trouble. So this is a presentation that's gonna be kind of geared with that in mind. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about fun, are the fundamentals of association structure. Uh, and here, essentially you have leadership, 
um, that's that's typically elected from the members. Usually that's a board of directors. They can be called trustees, um, but typically it's directors and that's what the, the laws are kind of geared toward. And the board of directors basically is the heart and soul of the, the organization. Um, they are tasked with setting the direction of the, the organization and seeing that um, the goals of the organization uh, are, are addressed um, as best they can using, using their best judgment. So key to that is to, to know the mission statement and, and kind of live by that in terms of what you do for the organization. You've got that there. I've set that in the parenthetical there the NAFTA mission statement. So, you know, you know how that applies here, but the, a, a, any organization typically is going to have some type of a mission statement, a, a kind of guiding purpose that you're going to be um, striving towards in, in terms of uh, your actions. Um, so the, the board of directors is going to authorize resources that's going to direct leadership and, and staff and kind of provide the, the organization with uh, financial direction as well. And that's kind of the hard part uh, with some of this is getting these things right or as, as, as right as you can in terms of the decisions that you're made, trying to be uh, efficient with the organization's resources um, especially in the nonprofit context, people are very cognizant of waste or inefficiencies in that regard. Um, so knowing how to, to kind of steer the organization and what to do to make things happen is, is the, the key part of this. And that takes some trial and error and, and some experience along the way. Um, the board of directors should provide adequate oversight with the organization. Now I will say too, the trick here in my experience is a balance in this regard. Uh, you can, there's a fine line between providing adequate oversight and, and micromanaging situations. Um, and a, a, an efficient and well run association is going to, to be effectively addressing that, that balance so that everything operates smoothly. If you, if you either have you know, inadequate oversight, people kind of asleep at the wheel, or you have micromanagement of every kind of transaction at the staff level, those, those two situations don't generally work. So you want a balance there. Uh, strategic planning helps in that regard. Um, uh, so that um, you're, you're cognizant of the, the organization's goals and kind of how to get there. A lot of times a consultant, um, may come in and, and provide, uh, you know, guidance in that regard. Um, the, uh, you could have an annual business plan. Um, th that's a good idea in terms of, of what you're going to be tasked with, with doing uh, for the organization and, and kind of breaking down in, out into some level of detail uh, and, and so that you've got kind of a roadmap. Um, and then provide organizational direction. To, to ensure that the goals are met, kind of set values and priorities for uh, the organization, kind of develop the culture as far as, as um, how the organization presents itself, and then address any kind of conflicts of interest. We're gonna get into that um, more specifically here in a second. So you have the board of directors at the top uh, of the, the, the organization as far as providing this direction. And then it's the role of staff uh, to execute. Um, so the, the staff needs that that uh, that direction from the board in order to know what it is that, that the goals are and and to get some some feedback in terms of how those might be achieved. And then it's the role of staff to go out um, and uh, make that happen you know, as best they can. Um, we want to be cognizant of the, the hierarchy of documents here. Uh, and that starts with um, the Articles of Incorporation. State law applies to um, nonprofit organizations. Typically, I mean, you have federal tax implications, but each organization is going to be uh, incorporated at, at the state level. Um, and so you have in your situation, uh, your incorporated in Oklahoma, which is, in, in my experience, an unusual place for many nonprofit organizations to be headquartered. But um, 
it's pretty tip so you don't have as much resources in that regard as far as the body of case law that you may have in other kind of more popular jurisdictions but you do have a, a perfectly suitable uh, corporate um, statute that applies and, and governs the the uh, activities of uh, the organization <clears throat> Now this applies to directors specifically, but I think it's a good idea to, to keep this in mind at all levels in terms of what the expectation should be with respect to, uh, to the organization and your dealings uh, with the organization. And also too, if you're not at the, at the director level, knowing what it means to take on that uh, obligation, should you ever desire to do so, or um, just to know what it is that leadership should be doing or not doing as the case may be. So fiduciary duties, uh, duty of care, um, and then this deals with the level of competence. This is the most important duty I would say, and that is basically to use your best informed judgment to guide the organization. And that requires a reasonable uh, inquiry in terms of facts and circumstances underlying any kind of transaction. Um, and with that would go obviously attendance uh, at board meetings, any kind of due diligence into proper transactions. Uh, you can't have a situation where you're basically sticking your head in the sand um, and then just you know showing up at meetings and seeing what happens. That's not sufficient in terms of what you need to do to guide the organization. So we want informed, uh, a, a, a informed decision making, uh, you know, attendance, engagement uh, with the organization. Uh, duty of loyalty. This means you're you're putting your your um, your stock in the organization that, and really acting in its best interest as opposed to any other interest that you may have. And this can come up in a few different situations. Uh, where you may ha have conflicting interests as far as maybe other organizations that you are engaged with or personal transactions or interests that you may have that may uh, have an impact on the organization in any way. Um, this is where the kind of concept of knowing which hat you may have on in a given circumstance comes into play. So when you're acting on behalf of NAFTA, uh, we all always want to be acting on NAFTA's best interest. We have to have our NAFTA hat on. We have to take any of those other hats that we may have as far as any conflicting, uh, you know, organizational relationships or or personal issues that we may have. Anything that may uh, may tend to pull against our our uh, allegiance to NAFTA, we need to put that aside and, and act on on behalf of NAFTA and NAFTA only. Um, so, you know, we want to take advantage of any opportunities that may be there for NAFTA. And then this is where conflicts of interest comes in. Um, and in my experience, that's a phrase that gets thrown around um, quite a bit and a lot of times not correctly. So, the, and also I think unduly stigmatized because it's become kind of, you know, like a, a, a stigma in terms of something that you know, if it comes up, if the phrase conflict of interest comes up, well, that's automatically a bad uh, situation and something that uh, may be scandalous in some respect. Um, so a couple things in, in that regard. A conflict of interest is something that comes up when it, you ha don't not have the ability to be uh, impartial. You need to be impartial in your decision making with respect to the organization. And if you're unable to do so for any reason in terms of your personal situation, then that's a conflict of interest. Now, that's not automatically a scandal, okay? And this comes up all the time. The key here, and what I would impress upon anyone uh, here today is err on the side of caution in identifying conflicts of interest, and then err on the side of disclosure. The only way that this becomes a scandal is if it's a conflict of, of interest that's not disclosed. If, if you disclose that conflict of interest, permit uh, un, un, unconflicted uh, decision makers to make any decision um, and proceed that way, it's a perfectly acceptable situation. And in fact, 
uh, many times, you know, let's say you have a reason why you may prefer, you know, some vendor over another, you got a personal connection to a particular vendor that the, the group's going to do business with. Well, as long as you disclose that, it could very well possibly be a situation where that vendor's offering just as good or a better deal than anybody else would to the organization. As long as unconflicted uh, decision makers decide that that's the best transaction to enter into, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But the key there is that the conflict is disclosed, you know, identified, disclosed, and then the person that is conflicted in that situation does not take part in the decision making. Now, on that point, that you can certainly take uh, the opportunity to present why you think this is a good uh, arrangement for the group. But the key there is that comes within the context of you having already disclosed that conflict and then not taking uh, part in the decision making process. Uh, duty of obedience. This is pretty simple. Basically, if you're tasked with doing something on behalf of the organization, you can't stray far from the path and get, get, you know, get the organization uh, into trouble that way or yourself into trouble by not sticking with what your task is as far as what you need to do for the organization. Um, if you get too far afield, you cause problems for, for both the group and potentially yourself. And then uh, duty to respect uh, confidential information. Um, Attorney-client privilege is a big deal uh, in the association space because a, a, a lot of times with a lot of different types of legal situations, associations can be dragged in because the thinking is that's where the industry information is. If we want to know what's happening in the industry for any reason to, to pursue any type of claim, then the association probably knows something about that. So we want to see what documents they have. And that's where we can get into problems with attorney-client privilege in particular. If you've got an attorney-client privilege in place, we may be able to cite that and not produce a document if we have a legal problem. However, um, if you, you got a situation where, let's say there's emails going around and there's attorney-client privilege with the group and the emails and, and the attorney's part of the chain, and that gets forwarded then to somebody outside the scope of the privilege, the privilege is waived. So if you're in any kind of leadership situation where you're dealing with an attorney-client privilege, um, be careful. You don't want to forward something along, you know, everybody likes to share, um, but you may do that inadvertently waive privilege and potentially, I've seen this happen before, uh, you know, you set the organization up for a big problem if, if they get involved in uh, litigation and have them to turn over documents that you know, involve a waived privilege. Um, other part of the, the duty of confidentiality that is critical and, and some groups really struggle with this um, is board of directors discussions. Those are strictly confidential. Basically the law is set up such that uh, a free and easy, you know, open discussion of ideas is encouraged among the members of the board. Um, you can't really have that if we're going to have somebody that runs off and says, here's what the board's talking about. Um, so the, the key takeaway there in that respect is that board of directors action is not confidential but board of directors discussions are. So that, that's what you need to keep in mind. We don't wanna have any kind of, you know, we, we were going to do this, but so-and-so wasn't on board with it, or so-and-so says this, and these folks are on one side and these are on another. That kind of thing is totally inappropriate. We wanna ensure that anybody on a board uh, understands and expects that any discussion that they have is, is strictly confidential so that we can share those ideas without worrying about them um, you know, being, being um, shared beyond the, the scope of the board. Uh, switching gears a little bit here to, to general risk management, and this goes for anybody, not just, uh, not just leadership or directors. Um, 
acting in good faith after reasonable inquiry is is the key. Um, and and mistakes are not punished if not reckless. And you, I'm talk here about a little bit of the framework that you have um, to protect you. But the main takeaway is uh, that you've got layers of protection that are sufficient, um, such that you really have to go pretty far afield to create problems where you're going to have personal liability. Um, now, where, where do you get into that? Uh, you would get into that with fraudulent conduct or criminal activity or maybe, you know, kind of gross negligence or something that is, is, is a bit shocking in terms of, uh, of its implications. What you're not going to have problems with is, you know, you, you didn't pick the right vendor or, you know, the organization lost some money or the, you know, investments were not as great as they should have been or anything like that. We don't nickel and dime with any of this. So it, it has to be a pretty serious situation to cause particular concern. Specifically, um, Volunteer Protection Act of 97, that is a federal statute that basically came about because folks realize that if you're going to ask somebody to volunteer for a nonprofit, but you're also going to then hold them personally liable for any uh, um, claims that may arise out of their general uh, participation in, in such an activity, that's going to disincentivize folks to, to participate. So with that in mind, you've got this federal legislation in, in uh, effect, which says, that uh, if you're acting within the scope of your responsibilities and you're not uh, being willful or reckless and what you're doing is genuinely believed to be in the association's best interest, we're not gonna have liability. Um, most states have uh, a statute in place um, that mirrors that at the state level. And I'll answer, I see a question that's come up about state implications. Um, and since we're talking again about states here, I'll, I'll handle that. Um, I would suggest as far as what state to incorporate in um, <laughs> that you stay away from uh, states that have extensive regulations. And that's just because that just, it becomes exceedingly difficult if you're incorporating in those compared to other places. Um, but I would also suggest a state with its own dedicated nonprofit corporation act, because you have a couple situations where they combined with the general corporation act. And in my view, that gets unnecessarily confusing. So with that in mind, stay away from California. <laughs> that there's just a, a sea of regulations that you have to navigate there. Uh, New York is no picnic either. Um, I, I'm just a little bit of a home court thing, but I, I think Illinois is pretty good uh, because we've got a we've got a dedicated nonprofit statute, a good body of case law, and the regulations are pretty um, pretty um, middle of the road. Um, I would also say Delaware is not great either, and I know that's where everybody wants to incorporate at a for-profit level, and that's great, but they don't have their own nonprofit statute. So that also, in my view, makes things unnecessarily confusing. Um, and so that having addressed that, we'll jump back in with uh, the, the next layer of protection for you, which is insurance um, that would cover uh, directors. It may cover others. I see there's an insurance question there. Typically, if you're, if you're operating on behalf of the group, even at a committee level, there's a good chance that you would have coverage under directors and officers policy. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so general structure and governance kind of from a high level um, on down. Um, it's a good idea to be incorporated. Um, you don't necessarily have to be, but it helps. And, and one of the main advantages there is reduced personal liability. What you're doing is you're putting a, a, a extra layer um, of protection there 
so that if there are claims, the claims then arise against and are brought against the organization, not the individuals personally. And there's additional protection because while it's kind of a common tactic to put somebody on personally as well, because it's scarier, you have to go through some hoops to show that there would be personal liability. And if you've done your due diligence to properly um, steer the organization and stay up with all your filings, um, most likely the, the, the claim would be against the corporation, which means you're shielded from personal liability. Um, corporations exist generally in perpetuity, uh, but you do need to um, maintain them with periodic filings that depend on where it is that you're incorporated from a state perspective. Um, and I'll say too, I could see it be conf confusing to somebody who may say, well, you know, he, he just talked about incorporating in Illinois, but I'm not in Illinois. That's not a substantive hurdle. Um, you do, if you were located somewhere else, you would have to register there as a foreign corporation, but that's not difficult. And that's something that you can do and just maintain um, as you go. Uh, but the problem that we see a lot of times with volunteer organizations is these things go sideways when there's some kind of a leadership change, some, someone uh, leaves the industry, somebody retires, somebody dies, and that was the person that was tasked with you know, maintaining the, uh, the corporation. So I, it's not uncommon for me to get involved with, typically it would be a new client and, and discover you know, you know, you haven't been incorporated for the last 10 years. <laughs> it's like, okay, but uh, we get that back on track, but those things do, do happen. And that's not necessarily good because if you don't have that corporation in place then you don't have that personal liability protection. So it, it is pretty important to keep these things going and current, know who's tasked with getting the job done. Um, you need to, uh, governing documents as far as incorporation for tax exemption. That's another reason that we want to incorporate. Um, you need to submit that with the application, your, your articles and your bylaws. Um, so if you've got the revoke corporate charter, and I just hinted that this a minute ago in terms of the, the implications here, um, you could be personally responsible. Um, so, you know, that extra important to keep that in place. Um, and then a lot of groups will have uh, chapters or sections or, or things that are called similar terms. Um, that can get messy too. Uh, and I've dealt with a lot of groups. This is kind of a, a probably pre COVID hot topic was getting your subordinate organizations kind of in line with what the, the headquarters is doing. Um, I have a number of clients that kind of have rogue chapters that do whatever they want. It's not in line a lot of times with what the headquarters wants. Um, and so then we have a discussion with them about the need for some degree of uniformity in that regard. Um, kind of think of that issue as uh, like a branding one. Um, we we want to know what it means to be a part of this organization. And we want some level of standardization across the board as far as what the experience is uh, for somebody as a member. So, you know, we want to know what that they're going to have a certain level that they're going to, to expect that is going to be uniform across the board. So, you know, while the chapters are going to have differences, we, we want to be sure that there's an expectation there that, that you know, that, that we understand what the experience is going to be like and that we're striving for some degree of uniformity in that regard. And we want to do the best we can um, to ensure that that happens across the various chapters. Now, depending upon the way that that's structured, this can be difficult too. All the, the situations I talked about with uh, needing to keep the corporation you know, in place and ensure that we've got engaged volunteers. Well, that's, you know, multiply that by the number of subordinate organizations you have. Um, and you can see that this gets tricky. You know, who's who's going to do that? Who's who's going to take care of all this stuff? Knowing that, and if we've got groups all over the place, um, folks might not know even how to to begin with some of this. So um, it can be a challenge. 
uh, but one that's worthy in working through so that you get uh, to a place where this functions smoothly. Everybody knows what it is that's expected of them and everybody knows what they can do to, to engage the resources that they need to, to avoid any problems in that regard. Nathan, there's a couple of questions about the insurance. I don't know if you're going to cover that in more detail later on, but there's about the types of and um... yes, yeah. Although, uh, if there's specific questions about NAFTA's insurance, I'm not going to have answers there. But I'll. Well, I think there. Nor, there's... nor do I. Nor do I. I'm not an insurance specialist. Like I just know, you know, types and 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 a little bit about those but as far as de coverage determinations and things like that i'm not going to probably be terribly helpful there but yes we'll get to that in just a bit perfect thank you um okay now let's talk a little bit about the uh hierarchy of documents here exciting stuff on a saturday uh here are the things that are it, it need to be in place to have a properly functioning group um Articles of incorporation, those are filed with the state. The easiest way I think to think about this is um, it's like your contract with the state, basically. And the state says in its statute, hey, we'll, we'll give you nonprofit corporation status if you provide us with this information. And, and it, typically it's not a whole lot that you need to get this going. Um, most uh, states require a minimum amount of directors. Uh, three is pretty typical in that regard. Um, a registered agent, that's somebody that that's important because that's somebody that would accept any service against the organization. And by service, I mean service of process, like with a lawsuit or any other kind of very important corporate filing. And then you need a, a purpose, basically. Um, you know, what, what, what nonprofit purpose are, are you um, fulfilling? And, and typically those fall into educational, charitable, scientific, um, or with respect to kind of more of a trade association, you know, furthering a particular profession or, or line of business. So you file those uh, with the state. Um, that's pretty easy. Uh, and you don't typically amend those um, very often. Uh, that by far the, the most common means or reason to amend those would be if you had a name change. And in fact, most of the amendment forms say, if it's a name change, just say that. If it's something else, you know, we can specify it. Um, and, and typically also those are a bit difficult to amend um, as far as the, the approvals that you need. Sometimes it'd be at the director level. Sometimes you have to go to the membership. But that's why we keep those pretty sparse because we don't need to, you know, we don't want to be going back to the state every time we have an issue and want to change something. Um, below that is the bylaws. Uh, and when I say below that, I, I, this truly is a hierarchy. So um, at the top of the hierarchy of state law, state statute that says, you know, here's what you need to do. Then below that, you have these articles of incorporation that I talked about. Below that, you have bylaws. So the important thing there is if anything in the bylaws conflicts with the articles of incorporation or the state statute, those, those higher are, uh, up sources are going to control. Okay? The bylaws will not be enforced if they're contrary to either the articles or the statute. The, but best way to think about the bylaws is like the contract between the organization and its members. Um, these, this is basically when you enter, you know, into uh, when you join the association. This is this is what you're agreeing to. Um, whether you know that or not, uh, we'd like to think everybody's familiar with the bylaws, understands what their roles and res responsibilities and you know, duties are in that regard. Oftentimes, not. Um, but that's something that we wanted, you know, that's why we do things like this, um, you know, to draw folks attention to the importance to, to know some of these things. Um, these will contain the procedures for association governance the, the, you know, how does, how does the group work? Who's, you know, is there a board of directors? Are there members? Are there voting rights? Um, things along those, you know, meetings, 
um, you know, how, how the organization functions. The trick here in my experience is to know what to put in those bylaws versus what to put in policies, which we'll talk about in a second here, um, but and striking the proper balance there. Uh, in particular, keeping an eye on whether we need, and oftentimes you do need a membership vote to amend those bylaws. That's also something we want to minimize um, if we can, so that we're not constantly you know, having to go out to the membership for things. And last, not least on that, um, board of directors policy statements. These are things that we don't think are sufficiently important to have in the bylaws, things where the organization is going to want to be more nimble um, and be able to act quickly and pivot easily at the board level. These things can be changed at any time um, by the board, which is what makes this, this handy. Um, just want to make sure that we're you're going through the proper steps there to, um, to ensure that um, they're properly adopted and then properly reflected and not the least of that, uh, easy to understand and, um, and easy to administer. Okay, I'll stop here for a few questions. Uh, is there a formula for professional associations in determining their ability to hire part-time slash full-time staff. No, that's just something that should be addressed um, by leadership as far as here's what we, here's the kind of staffing level we think we need to get done, uh, what we need to get done with the resources that we have. And that sounds easy and that's, I think not at all in practice, but no, there, there's no uh, bright line in terms of you know, staffing and how to handle that. Um, if there's a change to the articles, do those need to be refiled with the state? Yes, yes they do, which is why we wanna keep that to a minimum. Um, it's interesting, I have groups, some groups that go way back and it used to be you know, back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, the articles of incorporation were a big deal. They were very lengthy and they had all kinds of good stuff in them. Now the tr trend is really to keep those quite Spartan so that that really the, the most of the need of the organizational uh, functioning is reflected in the bylaws. Um, okay, and the chat was noted, if you're doing business by email, any mo motions that the vote needs to, to pass unanimously, that's an issue of state law. And I, did, I didn't do a deep dive, but I did look at this in Oklahoma, which doesn't have its own nonprofit statute. They're just lumped in with the general statute. And I didn't see spe anything specifically on that point. Uh, but I will tell you that most states do require uh, what that, what's called informal action, which is basically voting by email. Most states require that to be unanimous. Um, and the reason there is, and it's a good one if you think about it, uh, go back to what I said a, a, a few minutes ago about um, you know the free, uh, free and, and, and open exchange of ideas. Um, we can't really have that with an email vote the same way we can in a meeting um, context. So the idea with the requirement of a unanimous vote is yeah, if everything is if everybody's behind some very uncontroversial change, such that it's a slam dunk and everybody says, "Yeah, let's go forward with that." Well, okay, we don't need to have a meeting then to discuss that. But if we've got a holdout or two, that's an indication that the decision making process may benefit from having that meeting. And now, when I say meeting, I'm not talking about us all getting in a room somewhere. God forbid these days, or even on a Zoom somewhere, you could do that typically, uh, unless your governing documents provide otherwise, you could do that by phone. You just have a quick call and it could be quick. Hey, let's just, let's handle this issue. But if it's gonna be informal, um, that's where, um, where we need that unanimity. 
uh, are there stories that someone can share regarding the state organization uh, members being named in a lawsuit? Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily geared to me, but I'll give you an example that's the best thing that leapt to my mind in terms of the need to be on top of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and I can talk about it pretty freely because it's public record, um, but I'm involved in litigation uh, with a dental group um, that threw out some members from the organization. Um, and the organization got sued and uh, to put extra pressure on, as I, I think I intimated that this was a tactic earlier, um, the, the individual directors got sued. So there's like a dozen uh, defendants in this lawsuit that is just sitting in the circuit court of Cook County now for months with no action, which is fine by us because we're defending. Um, but each of these folks is named individually. They're, they're now defendants in a lawsuit. Now, the good news there is we've got insurance in place. Also, at least at the director level, most organizations will have a provision in their bylaws that says that they will indemnify, um, fancy legal word there, the, the directors if they're acting on behalf of the organization. And we certainly had no issue here as far as that. I mean, clearly they were, they were fulfilling their role. Um, but you know, it's a little scary. You get served with, you know, a lawsuit, you're a defendant now, who's going to, you know, who's going to foot the bill for this? This stuff's not cheap. What do we do now? You know, are, are my assets at risk? Um, so that's, that's what I have as far as an example in that respect. Um, should the bylaws be accessible to all association members? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, if you're going to ultimately in, like in this instance that I just talked about, if God forbid you take some action against them, um, for instance, uh, you're going to want to be able to to show, you know, here's why we're doing this and here's what authority we have to, to do this. And here's what you agreed to by virtue of your joining uh, the association. Um, the question, if we email by a uh, board incorporated in one state, we're held to the state in which we're incorporated, correct. Um, you know, it's not a situation of, well, you know, Johnny lives in California and they say something else and, you know, somebody else is in Pennsylvania, you know, what, what law applies. The law that applies to any association activities is going to be the law of uh, the state of incorporation, which in NAFTA's case is Oklahoma. As I said before, that's unusual, not a problem, but we don't have, we don't have a lot of guidance there. But there's the good news there is we don't have a lot of prohibitions there either, which, you know, I think it, it works out uh, okay. And you don't usually get into real challenges as far as the governance aspect of groups. All right, moving on. Um, how do we keep the, the organization in good graces with the IRS? Uh, and I guess I'll just kind of bridge the gap here between the last slide and this one, um, you would apply for a tax exemption to, to first become an exempt organization. Um, if it's a C6, that's more of a business focus. That's going to be IRS form 1024. If it's a C3, that's more of a charitable focus. That's going to be IRS form 1023. And then from there, you're going to need to uh, file annually uh, with the IRS uh, form 990, or in, if you're a small organization, 990EZ um, on that point. Um, and on, in that regard, you're going to be asked now, and this has become into vogue really uh, after the whole kind of Enron financial meltdown, there was a lot of that then geared at the nonprofit sector in terms of, oh, we got to make sure they're you know, up to, to par two as far as their ethics and good governance. So you've got this bullet pointed list here of the kinds of things that what may come up with the IRS. Um, it's a good idea to do some level of audit. Uh, and I get that, I get that question a lot recently. Do we have to do an annual audit? That's sure expensive. That's a lot of the, you know, organization's budget. Um, depends, I think, on the organization. That's not a terribly satisfying answer, but what I would say is 
it's a good idea, if not to do a full blown audit every year, to have some degree of of review by a third party. And so if you can do some type of scaled back thing, you, you may not need the full blown audit, but I think you do wanna do that periodically. Uh, you don't want to, you know, I, I've had clients contacting me recently, kind of like, we don't really need to worry about this, right? Like trying to get me to wink and nod and tell them they're all good and I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> so a good idea to, to err on the side of caution in, in, as far as this. Uh, and then, uh, maintain uh, various policies. Um, if you want to, a, a resource on this, it would be um, Board Effect. I don't remember if it's .org or .com, but Board Effect. Um, that's a, a website that's got various uh, samples you could use as a jumping off point. You, you could probably find some, some other things out there too. Uh, but you know, compensation policy says basically, if we're going to give somebody a bunch of money, um, we need to have some guardrails in place to make sure that they deserve it and that the folks that are deciding to, to pay that to them are you know, disinterested um, and that everything's above board in that regard. Uh, record retention policy, good idea to not have stuff sitting around too long because if somebody comes and asks for it, you can't just throw it away then when you decide it's harmful to you. Um, conflict of interest policy, typically what you'll have in that regard is a statement as far as what the policy is and an accompanying form that asks them to uh, disclose uh, any conflicts that they may have. And I talked about that at sufficient length, I think earlier, as far as how that should be handled. Um, and then that should be updated annually is a good idea. Um, you know, as far as, Hey, it's, you know, I know what we know what was going on last year, but anything this year that you need to disclose. And like I said, just err on the side of disclosure. Worst case scenario is somebody looks at that and, 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 you know, the decision is made. No, it's not, you know, it's not a conflict. Okay. Well, I just wanted to be sure because I didn't want to not disclose. Whistleblower policy, kind of a big deal to have that in place as far as uh, ensuring that things are transparent. If folks have concerns about what it is that's happening with the organization, we want them to have a framework in place that they can use to, to approach an issue like that. Um, you wanna maintain public records. Um, you're obligated to, to make those available if you've got a tax exemption. And then on top of that, at the association level, typically, it depends on the state, but the language usually says that members are entitled to review any of the corporate documents for a good and proper purpose or something like that. Um, and that's usually construed quite broadly uh, so that if they say, hey, I wanna come in and see some meeting minutes or, or you know, your form 990 or what have you, you've got that there for their inspection. Um, how often should bylaws be looked at and revamped? That's a good question. Um, my gut would be maybe every five years or so. You certainly don't need to do that annually. Um, and a lot of that stuff doesn't change. Um, but like an example would be some of the, like the email voting things or, um, you know, can we meet by a conference call, things like that, that folks oftentimes want to maybe insert in that if you haven't done a review like that for some time, you might not have, um, have thought of you know, email notice for meetings and things like that. That's, that's one of those that tends to just sometimes be a dinosaur that, you know, you're going to get a, a letter in the mail telling you when the next meeting is. Hey, Nathan, regarding the, uh, one of the last points you just made, there's a question in the chat about financials and how detailed are the reports to the members and how often should they be made? Um, I think you can do that uh, as you may prefer. I, I would say um, annually, you could do more than annually if you wanted to, but I don't think it's be a problem just to do that annually. All right, uh, switching gears a little bit to kind of the risk management side of this. Um, apparent authority. Um, 
uh, th this is something that's important to keep in mind at every level. I think it's more probably an issue at the board level because the re reasonable reliance standard is uh, more probably in effect there than it would be at a lower level with the organization. But this is something to keep in mind regardless, even, even in your employment dealings or whatever else. But we this comes from the law of agency, which recognizes that there's an agency there are an agent and a principal and the agent acts on behalf of the principal. That's really any employment relationship of any kind operates on that basis at some level. Um, but the idea here is if, if a third party reasonably relies on the representations of the agent uh, as, as far as what it is that the principal is bound to, um, then the principal can be bound by that even if the agent doesn't have the ability to, or the authorization to make that uh, to make that connection. So if if someone reasonable, you know, if somebody comes to let's say a director of NAFTA and says, "Hey, come have a meeting," let's say at this this facility, and the director signs off on this meeting contract, NAFTA is not going to be able to say to the, the facility later on, oh, no, 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 no. That person was not uh, was not authorized to enter into that transaction on behalf of NAFTA. So we're sorry about that misunderstanding, but you know we, we don't have a binding contract now because this guy was out of his, his lane to do this. It does not work that way. As long as that, that uh, reliance is reasonable, then you're going to have a situation where the, the principle is bound. So with respect to your, your dealings with NAVTA or any, anywhere else, be mindful of this. Uh, if you purport to represent NAVTA, or if somebody would reasonably believe that you represent NAVTA, guess what? You might represent NAVTA, even if NAVTA didn't want to, even if you weren't intending to represent NAVTA. So that, you know, keep that in mind as we go the, through the rest of this. Um, I'm going to hit this stuff pretty quickly. Uh, no need to get deep into the weeds here on the antitrust stuff, and certainly don't expect you to, to walk away, you know, thinking about the Sherman Act for the rest of the day. Um, but we do need to, be, need to be particularly mindful of this at the association level because antitrust laws, for the most part, deal with relationships and transactions between competitors. And associations are groups of competitors. So associations are kind of this walking antitrust target. Uh, and I already also talked about that, you know, that's where the industry resides. That's where the information is. If we wanna know what's happening um, with veterinary technicians, well, we'll go to NAFTA. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll have all the information that we need. Uh, we'll just seek, you know, seek what we can get from them and then have the answer to, to all of our questions and find out what bad things people were up to, let's say at the NAFTA meeting. Um, so antitrust law here, it, it, it applies to anything that has the purpose or effect of restricting competition. And I wanna emphasize effect. You know, some people may get up in the morning and say, you know what I'm gonna do is go fix prices for veterinary technician uh, procedures at the NAFTA meeting. That's, that's on my agenda today. Um, but most people wouldn't. Most people wouldn't really think about that uh, in a sinister way. But at the same time, they may get on some type of NAVTA message board or something and say, am I charging enough for this? What do you guys charge? Guess what? Same problem. <laughs> okay. Um, that's something that would have the purpose or effect of restricting competition. And this applies to all manner of association uh, uh, activities. So we're not talking about just meetings or formal act things. We're talking about on the golf course, at the bar, okay, at breakfast, uh, what have you. It, any 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 time you have competitors together, we need to be worried about this stuff. So I got the kind of statutory. Um, uh, references there for you, but uh, just to hit on that real briefly with the Sherman Act, contracts, combinations, and conspiracies, which unreasonably restrain trade. The takeaway there is it's perfectly acceptable for one 
competitor to decide to do something. And it's okay if other competitors decide to do the same thing. Where that becomes an antitrust violation is when the competitors agree to do the same thing. And the problem that we have with associations generally is they offer a lot of opportunities for which you know, competitors could, can use those to agree. And that becomes a problem um, for the association and the individuals involved. Um, you could go to jail for this stuff um, in, in a worst case scenario. Not to mention uh, damages that treble damages means triple. So if you could show that you were damaged by you know, being shut out of the marketplace or something, and you were able to put a dollar figure on that, then the damages you would be owed would be triple what that amount is. That could be enough to bankrupt an organization. Um, so this is pretty serious stuff. Um, you've also got Federal Trade Commission Act. That's a little broader uh, prohibition on kind of unfair uh, methods of, of competition. A uh, good idea to have compliance policy in, in effect, you know, to announce this stuff at, at your meetings. Hey, we comply with the antitrust laws. Uh, we've got staff that's knowledgeable about this. We're watching for these issues. We've got counsel that we can engage as we need to. Um, one of the, I'll say this just as a blanket statement and that applies to this and anything else. However, um, it's better to have no policy at all <laughs> Then it is to have a policy that you don't enforce, uh, because that looks that looks really bad. And you get this a lot of time, kinds of in the HR context. Oh, you had this policy. Well, did you use it? Well, no, we didn't. Well, that's not great. Um, would have been better maybe to just say, well, we never really thought of that. Then we thought of that, and we just don't follow what we said we should be doing. So that applies here as much as anywhere else. So make sure agendas are are. Uh, acceptable in terms of what the, what's going to be discussed. Groups can have problems here. Uh, there was a major, uh, it was the Association of National Association of Music Merchants uh, had a, a, a meeting, this is probably 10 years ago, about uh, minimum advertised pricing and how to deal with that. And how, you know, basically come, come with all your price problems and we'll have a nice round table where we can all, the big competitors can go around the room and talk about the right way to price uh, goods. That's terrible. Um, and landed them in, in hot water with the feds. Um, so make sure that you know any topics that we're teeing up for discussion are appropriate. The, the part of that that gets tricky is these things can take a left turn um, as far as, you know, wow, all of a sudden somebody's volunteering information about price or, or something else that's competitively sensitive. Um, so we need to do more than just be concerned with uh, the topics. We need to be concerned with the actual discussions. Um, in that regard, if you're at a, a meeting where things go you know, astray in this respect, um, you, you typically do have, a, if you're in a situation where there's going to be minutes, you can have your negative vote you know, recorded by name. Um, if a situation comes up and you're not comfortable, the, the Standard legal advice there is to leave conspicuously, uh, and in the in-person situation, you know maybe you dump the pitcher of water out, or you flip the table, or <laughs> something. I'm exaggerating, but the idea is get yourself out of that situation. Uh, report the, the, it to staff as far as what your concern is, and just make sure that that that's acknowledged and that the steps are taken. You can't unring a bell, but you can, you know, write a ship. Um, and then minutes uh, are another topic that, that can have antitrust and, and other uh, implications. Remember, these are freely discoverable. These are the, uh, the official record of the actions taken uh, at a meeting. They should uh, reflect what was done, not what was said. Remember what I said about confidential information. The, the idea is we have the free and open discussion. We properly document those actions in the minutes. We're not gonna say there was a lengthy discussion. We're not gonna say someone strenuously objected, all right? Those are all things that a, a, a attorney would look at and say, oh, I've, you know, I can ask these people about that in a de deposition, uh, which we don't want. Uh, and then typically no, no minutes for executive sessions. Um, 
pick up on this a little bit too, because I see we're running low on time. Um, things that can cause antitrust problems. Uh, membership restrictions. We can't have a situation where somebody alleges that they're being unreasonably restricted in the marketplace. So make everything reasonable and objective. You know, if you if you are in this line of business, you're you're eligible to be part of the group. Uh, member expulsion, near, an issue near and dear to my heart in light of the pending litigation. Uh, you need to go through due process to do that. You can't just throw somebody out without giving them notice and an opportunity to be, to be heard. Now, uh, as I'm strenuously arguing in that pending litigation, um, it's you're not entitled to a judicial-like process. This is not a criminal type of uh, hearing that, that's required. We just need to have the minimum there uh, to ensure that we're not acting uh, without uh, proper justification. We're giving people an opportunity to, to be heard. Um, Availability of association services to non-members, that's a common issue that comes up. The kind of general rule for that is you can restrict things to members only. If it's not vital to success in the marketplace, it's usually not. Um, so it's not typically an issue, but most groups will do handle this by offering uh, member and non-member pricing variations, which is extremely common. Um, Articles and presentations, those are treated the same way as meetings. Again, freely discoverable. And, and this, you know, something that's put out in an industry, you know, a, a nav to publication or something, that's that's important as far as uh, something that could be cited uh, in terms of reflecting the mindset or the activities of, of the group. Ah, insurance. Um, here are your general types. You're probably familiar with these at some level. CGL, that's something every business is gonna have. That's gonna cover slips and falls and things of that nature. Um, you know, kind of your run of the mill insurance. Uh, directors and officers liability. Here's where we start to get, you know, association specific. Um, this, the best example of this, that, or the best uh, characterization of this that I've heard is, this is insurance that covers anything that happens in the boardroom. And I guess we're not talking about a slip and fall that would happen in the boardroom, but decisions made by the organization. If the decision is made by the organization in the boardroom um, or virtually how, or maybe unanimously by email, um, then this will cover both the organization and those involved with the organization that, that have made this decision typically uh, Board members could be staff, but it could also extend to volunteers uh, at a lower level. The, co the coverage here tends to be fairly broad, although, again, I don't want to generalize uh, as far as that goes, but that's what the association is for. That's typically what it covers, and it's a good idea to have that. Uh, again, you've got volunteer immunity. A couple of other uh, policies, you could have errors and omissions if if the association is providing some particular type of service uh, and then conference interruption or, or you know, can't, event cancellation insurance too um, is something that's a good idea to have. But I will tell you there that that's oftentimes riddled with exemptions, expensive, um, and depending upon how much revenue you get from your meetings, you know, may or may not be a good investment. Uh, are we not to record me meetings for executive board meetings? What I was saying was executive session is where you shouldn't have meetings or, or minutes. And that's where you're basically going into a more private subset. Uh, that's oftentimes where like a staff review would occur. Um, you know, you don't want the full board in there for some reason. That's when you wouldn't have minutes. Executive board, um, that's like a board of directors meeting. That, that should be minute. They should have minutes for that. Um, so is that to say a VTA should not advocate for wages for credentialed veterinary technicians? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand that question, but it would be entirely appropriate for the organization to advocate for um, higher wages generally for 
VTAs, that's fine. Where we get into problems is what are you paying your people? Or what are you paying your people? Or what do you, oh, well, I'm clearly not, you know, I'm, I'm paying too much. I'm, I'm gonna go down to what these folks are doing. We can't have any kind of round table, you know, type discussion on something like that. Just as there's a, a market for products that we need to be mindful of from an antitrust perspective, there's also a market for services and labor. I have one group that I started representing maybe five years ago, and I came in and to represent them and kind of did a bit of an audit on their uh, documents, and they had a code of ethics that, among other things, contained a pledge not to hire any other members' employees. Blatant antitrust violation. I mean, you can't get. I mean, that's that's a, that is a, a black and white restriction on competition. So worked with them to say, hey, you know, have you had any problems with this ever? No, that's you know, it's kind of who we are. And I'm like, well, not anymore because I don't want anybody to go to jail. So we stripped that out of their culture, and thankfully that's gone okay. But that's something that you know people don't necessarily think of. To my point about you know not getting up and wanting to to violate antitrust laws. Um, but that that is an agreement that would have both the purpose and effect of restricting competition. So, you know, that's an example of something to keep in mind. Uh, does an association need insurance in all meetings? And oh, I'm assuming if all meetings and events are virtual, I would recommend yes. Again, when I said directors and officers insurance covers what happens in the boardroom, that doesn't mean we have to be in person. That, that really means anything at the at the association governance, you know, leadership uh, level. So uh, yeah, I think I think you go without insurance on something like this probably at your own peril. And I will also say, at least as to a DNO policy, that I think you do get big good bang for your buck. Um, that's something that generally will, in my experience, provide the coverage that you're looking for. And um, typically is not an arm and a leg. Uh, isn't wage transparency a federally protected right? Okay, I can go out and tell everybody what I make, as can a, a veterinary, veterinary technician. What we can't do as a group of competitors in an association context is have a discussion about what we pay people because that is going to be, that's competitively sensitive information that if shared would have the purpose or effect of potentially driving down what everybody's getting paid. If we go all around the room and say what we pay each person that does a particular job, those, those uh, numbers very well might just start to resemble themselves, especially because people that realize they're overpaying are gonna be incentivized to come down um, and that's exactly the kind of concern that antitrust laws are focused on. So certainly an individual can go talk about what they make, but we can't have a discussion of that type of information among competitors in the association context. And Nathan, if I can just jump in. So to put that in context here, so we couldn't have a roundtable meeting uh, with representatives from Banfield and VCA and every, every other major hospital out there discussing what they pay vet techs because that, could, that would be an antitrust violation. Correct. Now I will tell you this. Uh, I used to go to Vegas for this every year and then the partner stole it back, but now it's come back around because he's retiring. But I, we, I have, a, there are a couple of groups and these the ones I'm thinking of are in the oil industry and they really want to have that information. Uh, like they want to have that kind of discussion. And what they do is they hire a third party. They give all of that information that they have to the third party. They make sure there are certain standards that you need to meet to make sure that this is okay. And one of them is that you have a bunch of people one of them is that the, the information that you're using is sufficiently old, and then you have, a, have to have third-party involvement. And they, they spend tons of money generating this data that then gives reports back to the members that are painstakingly broke down into here are the kinds of salary ranges for these types of positions. 
and and they then try to talk further about that and usually we have to shut them down in the types of discussions that they can have but that's how you would handle that but also that's very resource intensive that's that's beyond the scope of what most organizations can do in that regard uh, can an organization require job postings have wages on it that's a good question and I just we did a we do a firm zoom um each week and i can't remember what state it was i think it was new york I, I, we, you could probably google this after we get off of this but um one state just said basically any going forward any help wanted it might be california um any help wanted ads had to have a wage associated with that you could, you, the, new york okay you got somebody there that that knows this so and I will say too, anytime something happens in New York or California, a lot of times that catches on other places. So th that would not surprise me if that's the way that this goes, um, which is to say you can't just do salary commensurate with experience or however you would soft pedal that typically. Awesome. And, any other questions? Done a great job covering everything, Nathan. Thank you. This is the the chat was just in, incredibly active during this entire session. So, <laughs> good. Thank you. I know we could we could I spend guess. that. I hope good. Yeah, so it, it was it's all very good, and it, okay, well, it's all very gratifying for me too because watching people help each other, it's really it's a tremendous uh, tremendous high here. So. Um, Thank you, Nathan. This is it's been incredibly helpful. Like I said, we could probably spend another hour or so talking on these things. Hopefully, there's a, a lot of great takeaways. Hopefully, um, no one is panicking too much about the things that they need to do to put their association in in good shape in terms of um, their legal documents, their insurance policies, things along those lines. If there are further questions on this, certainly you can. Uh, anyone can reach out to me uh, through director at navda.net, and I can uh, I can answer those, or I can funnel them over to Nathan, um, and we can get you answers and, and put resources at your fingertips as well. Um, but we need to. Um, we're running over on our time. We've got another uh, webinar that's going to uh, start in just a few minutes. Um, so thank you all for the time. Thank you, Nathan, for your, sharing your expertise with us. I really do appreciate it. Um, if you're able to, I hope you're able to um, join us on our, the next webinar, um, which is uh, part of the chat that I saw going on. It's all about engaging members and keeping them engaged. That one's going to begin in about 20 minutes or so. Um, if you don't have the link to that um, that special Zoom session, um, just send an email to info at navda.net and we'll get that over to you quickly. Uh, but again, Nathan, thank you again for your time and your expertise. Really appreciate it. And, My pleasure. Um, yeah, been great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.